Welcome. I'm Angela Robbins and I teach history here at Meredith College. On behalf of my colleagues in the Department of History, Political Science and International Studies and our library and archives, thank you for joining us today. We have been commemorating the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment with virtual guest speakers and other special programming throughout the year. And we have an engaging and lively panel assembled for you today with a focus on collecting women's histories and telling women's stories. Our panelists welcome your questions, which you may type into the Q&A throughout the program. First, each panelist will present and then we'll bring them all together to respond to your questions at the end. If you are unable to stay for the entire program, you'll be able to view the recording on Meredith College's YouTube channel. First, we welcome Kira Lyle. Kira graduated with a BA in anthropology from the University of Delaware in 2017. Her senior archeology span seminar paper, 100 Dead Babies Does Not a Brothel Make, a proposal for further excavations in the city of Ashkelon, was surely powered by what her advisor called internalized feminist rage. Currently a dual master's student at the University of South Carolina, Kira is pursuing degrees in library and information science, as well as public history. This degree combination allows her to work in and between library, archive, and museum collections. Her presentation today is based on her master's thesis. A woman's place is in the archive, archiving South Carolina women and the development of a counter collection, which is a culmination of her work in archives, an effort to ground critical archival theory in the work of community collections and feminist rage. Please join me in welcoming Kira Lyle. Thank you so much, Angela. I'm gonna share my screen with everyone. Okay. So this project is really uh, the culmination of work that I've been involved with and research I've been able to do, um, investigating not only the content of this collection, but more so its transformation from a personal private assemblage to a public archival collection. So in essence, this is the biography of a bunch of boxes. Um, this is the story of South Carolina women from its inception and the process of gathering by Dr. Mary Baskin Waters, who is a feminist activist and community leader in South Carolina through its processing and digitization and into its possible transfer to the university library system, the University of South Carolina library system. So when I say that this is a biography, it's a biography of the collection itself, right? It's a biography of the transformative work to create an archive that is open and knowable to a broader public rather than just uh, Dr. Waters. So this is an archive of activism in that it contains activist materials. It's also an undertaking in archival activism, which is an examination of the broader political potential of archives when their history can be deployed in the present. And much of the thinking that I draw on in this regard is from a book called Make Your Own History, Documenting Feminist and Queer Activism in the 21st Century, which is edited by Liz Bly and Kelly Wooten. And it combines the work of scholars, activists, archivists, who talk about their collections and the work that is done within communities to preserve their history and how that history is put to work. And really why um, saving things in communities of people who are epistemologically oppressed as well as oppressed in, in many other ways is in itself a form of activism. So archives contain political potential and we put that history to work in our present by using archives as spaces to create knowledge. And so when I, when I talk about archives as spaces of knowledge production, I'm kind of contrasting that as archives simply as places of, of recovery. So for women's collections specifically, uh, the development of women's histories as a discipline in the 60s and 70s in academia created a demand for women's papers and women's collections. And so existing archives added collections by women, the papers of women, or chose to highlight women that already um, exist in other collections. And so Marika C4 and Stacey Wood argue in, in their article, Critical Feminism in the Archive, that by merely adding women's collections to existing archives without using the knowledge of these women to question the power of the archive itself and archival practice is merely incorporating women into inherently oppressive knowledge systems. So when I say that archiving South Carolina women can be a space for knowledge production, it is that it is a 
space to question archival standards and best practice and make conscious choices about the archive that in this case reflect community knowledge, feminist theory, and critical theory. So the primary source base for this project that I will be talking about and showing you are interview interviews with Dr. Waters, who really, as the person that collected these materials, um, formed the intellectual infrastructure. So I interviewed her, also Travis Wagner, who was at one point Dr. Waters' graduate assistant and was really instrumental in the creation of, of this digital project. There are three digital projects that I'm, I'm gonna share with you. So the first is Archiving South Carolina Women, the WordPress site, which was the first digital manifestation of this project. Below that is um, Archiving South Carolina Women, the archive.org site, which for all intents and purposes is the primary digital repository for this project and it's still being added to. And then below that is a project that I created for a separate class with Travis Wagner using materials from Archiving South Carolina Women and really grounded my uh, practice explicitly in feminist theory. And so I'm gonna speak about that as well. Uh, Archiving South Carolina Women has been used as a teaching collection for now four years. And so the class that really set the standard for documenting their work was the fall 2018 iteration. And so I really relied on their Google Drive, not only in that way to not only have the archive itself as a source base, but really their processual documentation. So this is the woman herself, Dr. Mary Baskin Waters. So in addition to being um, an activist and community leader, she is also a women's studies professor and scholar. And so in the eighties and nineties, she was adjuncting at a number of institutions, but in 1990 in, in particular, she was at Newberry College and her commute was quite long. And so sometimes going to or from teaching, she would stop at a restaurant called the Back Porch Cafe. And there she met Betty Dominic, who was the manager at the time and was already involved with the South Carolina Commission on Women. So Dr. Waters and Betty Dominic have, you know, overlapping interests, they become friends. And this is how Dr. Waters became involved with specifically the South Carolina Commission on Women. Um, I will tell you that the South Carolina Commission on Women is a state commission on women, which came about after the 1961 Commission on the Status of Women created under the Kennedy administration, which then led to state-based agencies. And South Carolina's was founded in 1971. So Dr. Waters served as the director from 1992 to 1997, and she served as the commissioner from 1998 to 2007. The commission is now defunct. And Dr. Waters described to me her, her time in the government as kind of um, experiencing hostility in the form of apathy, and that she and her colleagues um, really had an understanding that under these conservative administrations that their agency was not going to receive the same interests and resources to be successful that, that perhaps other agencies would. Um, and she describes this as insidious non-interest. And so for me, I talk about feminist rage, but Dr. Waters really met this with kind of exuberance and a real verve for collecting because she really took on the responsibility that if, if other people weren't going to find this work important that she knew was, then she then took on the job of really uh, collecting the historical memory of this woman's work. So the reason I identify this as a counter collection is because it directly responds to materials that are held in other repositories. So the materials in Archiving South Carolina Women are not all entirely unique to this collection. Because the South Carolina Commission on Women is a government agency, there are records of the commission held in the state archives. And so Dr. Waters describes when she was preparing materials for the state archives, it was kind of like one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. So there are materials that are held at the state archives that also appear um, in, her, in her collection. But it's a very different context, the two collections, right? And so Dr. Waters Archiving South Carolina Women is a counter collection because it provides a different access point to the social and political history of South Carolina. So here is the real moment of, of transformation from a small C collection, a private personal assemblage to a capital C collection, right? Like a public archival project. And so in 2013, Dr. Waters has a graduate assistant named Travis Wagner, who is now a professor in the library school. And so that's how I was introduced to Travis and, and this collection. Um, but Dr. Waters had, still has, an extensive collection of VHS tapes from the 90s about uh, like abortion and sexual health and political rights for women, right? And um, Travis Wagner has expertise and knowledge in audiovisual archiving and audiovisual preservation. And so he says to Dr. Waters, if you care about the content on these VHS tapes, perhaps leaving them in their VHS form is not the best for their health and well-being. And, and maybe we should think about digitization 
is this something you'd be interested in? And so Dr. Water says, yes. And if you like that, boy, do I have something to show you. That's not a direct quote. But she takes Travis to her uh, storage unit at the time where these, these boxes are being held. And so kind of literally and figuratively, these boxes are taken out of the dark of the storage unit into the light. And so this is the moment when uh, Dr. Waters and Travis are going through these materials and really thinking about how do we make these open to other people and open um, to research and access, right? So they decide to create a digital archive. Why digital? Uh, it's based on principles, but also pragmatics. So I, we, we want to be very careful, right? Because it's, it's not to say that digital archives provide universal access and physical archives do not, because of course, like access is, is complicated. Um, but digital archives do kind of forego some of the controls applied by physical archives who have to balance security and preservation with access. Also pragmatically, if you're using graduate student labor on a college campus where there are scanners and computer labs for students, your cost is, is low or nothing. So a digital archive is decided on. So the first manifestation of this project is Archiving South Carolina Women, the WordPress site, which was active from 2014 to 2016. I'm gonna scroll for a minute. So if that's gonna make anyone dizzy, just close your eyes for a second because we're gonna go all the way to the bottom. We're almost there. Here we go. The mission of the project, which was written by Dr. Waters in October of 2014. And this is really going to set the tenor for this project moving forward until now. So she writes that the purpose of this blog is to provide a space to remember and celebrate South Carolina women's history with an emphasis, an emphasis on what? On making information accessible for research, education, and empowerment. So from the very beginning, access and openness is, is the key tenet of this collection. And I do think it's important to recognize um, that she's writing that this information is not just for research, but for empowerment, which really emphasizes the emotional and psychological power of archives. So I'm gonna point everyone to two archival interventions that are present in this WordPress site. So this is the first post. Up from here is the second, it's a 1990 conference at USC Coastal. And you'll notice at the bottom, there is hyperlink text, you click through, and you have the complete digital surrogate of this item. Um, you can print it, you can download it, do as you will with it, right? So that is, I'm gonna go to the, I'm gonna scroll again, sorry. We're gonna go to the very last post that was created. And if you notice on the more recent ones, there is text that specifically invites this behavior to view or download, click here. Uh, to view and download, click here, right? So this invitation to download, use and keep the materials is a very different way of thinking about user interaction with items beyond that of the physical archive, which would have, for example, the state archives, right? Which would have physical barriers to entry, uh, paywalls for making copies, right? Ownership statements, citation statements. Um, so this is a, a different way of thinking about how users are going to, to have access to your materials. Also, you'll notice that these items don't have like a metadata listing. Instead, it's a narrative explanation of the item, but at the bottom, we have kind of subject headings, tags, which not only tell the user, what is this about? It's about the American Association of University Women. It's about women in higher education, right? But these are linked. And so linking these subject headings really is a way for archivists to create connections between materials and put materials in conversation with one another. And so my favorite, I just, I think this one is, it's just my favorite, I don't know, is the pay gap. So if you click through, there are three materials for about the pay gap. And I think what's also important to note is that the pay gap is not a library of Congress subject heading. It's not part of the language, uh, the cataloging language of the State Archives of South Carolina. It really is terminology which reflects how Dr. Waters knows and understands this history and, and the issues therein. So that is our first stop in the story. Next, next, we go to, um, Archiving South Carolina Women as a Teaching Collection. So SLIS 777 is a service learning course. Um, it was initially taught by Dr. Elise Lewis and Archiving South Carolina Women has been used as a teaching collection in three, now four, iterations of the class beginning in 2016 when Travis joined as a co-instructor. So in 2016, Dr. Waters and Travis agreed on using archive.org. 
www.yarchive.org. Again, it's principles and it's pragmatic. So archive.org is free for users on both ends. The metadata fields are really malleable and customizable. It's open access and it is the internet archive, which bills itself as a place to quote, to provide universal access to all knowledge. So the 2016 and 2017 iterations of the class really focused on text-based documents and they focused on also migrating everything that's on the WordPress site over to archive.org. The 2018 class expanded the forms of digital content. They did visual, visual materials, so photographs, buttons, and slides. And they also set really the documentation standards for this project. For this project. And I'm going to show everyone three archival interventions that have been taken. So first off, you'll have a picture of this light box. So the students built a light box themselves out of cardboard. They used phone cameras and phone lights. And so not only is this a tool to add variety to the collection and be able to take really professional looking photographs of, of the buttons, but it also, I think more broadly speaking, allows the collection to remain self-sufficient. And it sets a precedent that, you know, smaller archives, independent archives, community archives can find innovative ways to match the work of institutions with perhaps better resources. So I'm now going to take you to an item and we're going to talk about two um, other interventions. So this is a women's collection, Archiving South Carolina Women. Many of the events that are photographed are, for example, the American Association of University Women. However, describing any people in any context is, is totally subjective and perhaps more so if you cannot identify them. So just because this is a women's collection, doesn't mean that every person photographed is a woman, like perhaps not, right? And so this photograph, for example, the people in it are not gendered. So there are attendees mingling, attendees mingle at this conference um, about childcare. And this conversation about whether or not to gender people and how to incorporate gender into titles is documented in the Google Drive for the metadata team. In their working document, their draft for the metadata schema, they have a section tentatively titled super subjective dash what to call them comma gendered question mark question mark question mark so this is a good place to say um that no these students are not members of this community that they're archiving they weren't present at these meetings they weren't you know doing this work in in the 90s however by thoroughly documenting their working process um there is a level of transparency which is then critiquable and so clearly in this case, there's an effort to question and really disrupt the normalization of gender in cataloging. Now for the third thing I'll show you, perhaps you would not associate item level cataloging with radical practice. However, give me 45 seconds and I hope you'll change your mind. So item level, item level cataloging is radical in that it is an effort to make something that was perhaps hidden or history that was not revealed undeniably present in a catalog. And so my thinking on this comes from Jenna Friedman, who is the zine librarian at Barnard. And she cataloged the zines in her collection at the item level using feminist subject headings like third wave feminism and riot girl. And this is important because the impact of these subject headings is relative to how often they appear in the catalog. So for an example for this collection, we'll go to American Association of University Women. Archive.org calls these topics, but they're keyword subject headings for all intents and purposes. So you click through and it will load. And I've already done this. So I can tell you there are 93 results, right? This subject heading is for the fall 2018 class. There's 39 of them. So about half of these results that you're gonna get are from the work of that class. And I'll tell you that the photographs that they were cataloging were in bundles with rubber bands around them, which is an issue unto itself. But if they had chosen to catalog them in rubber band bundles, you would have far less results, right? So that's really an effort to make these materials very present in the catalog. And now, our last stop, this is the last stop in the chronology of the collection, but for me personally, this was my introduction to these materials. In the spring of 2019, I took a class called Advanced Seminar in Archival Representation, which was taught by Travis Wagner. And so we were each tasked to create a digital archive. And I, I told Travis that I was very interested in how uh, race and how gender are represented in archives. And so he said, do you want to use these items? And I was like, absolutely, like, let's get it. So I'm given these items and I really wanted to temporally this is a third wave feminist collection in that it, it dates to 
about the late 80s, the 90s, into the early 2000s. And so not only did I want to explicitly ground my practice in feminist theory, but also I really wanted to think about how the tenets of third wave feminism um, can be represented. So one of those is kind of recognizing the plurality of feminism and that there has never been a we of feminism. Like women are not a monolithic block. So the identities of women, their race, you know, nationality, ethnicity, class, all of these things um, then form how their feminism is expressed. Right. And so in trying to recognize the identities of the women in this collection, I named it archiving Colombian women. And this is because the women of Columbia, South Carolina are represented, of course, but also there are materials from the nation, the country of Columbia. Um, and this is because Dr. Waters participated in Partners of the Americas, which is another Kennedy era initiative to create partner cities in the Western Hemisphere. So Columbia, South Carolina had a partner city, a sister city in Columbia, the country. So Dr. Waters in interacting with those women collected some materials that really represented what their, their, their issues are and what these women were talking about, which was you know, economic independence, um, violence in households, right? And so in titling the collection Archiving Colombian Women, I wanted to really kind of actively complicate the identities of the women that are gonna be represented from the title, like from the very beginning and to prevent the flattening of who these women are. Initially or additionally, I wanted to really um, consider how to functionally address uh, the positionality of an archivist in their work. And I wanted to avoid creating a, a biography of myself because I wanted to center not my personal history, but like how my identity uh, was manifested in the work and really emphasize that. So I created, in addition to a finding aid, a making aid for this collection. And so it discusses subject headings, why I chose to engage with Library of Congress, how I tried to connect different collections using the same subject headings and put those collections in conversation with one another, related collections, so Archiving South Carolina Women, what's up? Literature that really underpinned my thinking. And then finally, something which I think is hardly ever addressed with users of archives, which is why a collection came to be cataloged in the first place. Um, was it grant funded? Was there a particularly prominent researcher who wanted to use the items, right? Like that's very, very seldom visible to users. So I wanted to make clear, this is for a project, a class project, that's why these items were cataloged. And also because of the class project, it's a little bit more experimental than traditional perhaps. And so in conclusion, archiving South Carolina women in 2020, what's going on? Dr. Waters, still at it, don't worry. She's still field archiving. People bring her articles all of the time. So archiving South Carolina women is still growing. She's still teaching and really emphasizing to all of her students that self-documentation is important and valuable and is a responsibility. And so she's really trying to um, invest that knowledge and that drive in other people. The collection is still kind of in physical limbo. Parts of it are being transferred to the university collections. Um, I think that's kind of been put on hold because of COVID. There also was a charge for Dr. Waters to fundraise, to have funding for this collection. So that is something that is in process, um, but perhaps paused right now. There is a 2020 iteration of SLIS 777 that I am enrolled in. And we are adding to the Archiving South Carolina Women um, archive.org site. These are some of the materials. So Archiving South Carolina Women is alive and well and still growing and able to be written about and presented about far into the future. Um, so I'm gonna hand it back off to Angela. Wow, thank you so much, Kira. This is really exciting. What an amazing contribution uh, to women's history, archiving women's, um, women's collections uh, and such unique approaches. I look forward to hearing what kind of questions our panelists and attendees have for you later. Um, again, remember, um, if you do have questions, go ahead and put those in the Q&A. And after all of our um, panelists have had their opportunity to present, we will, um, we will take the questions. So next up, um, is um, Morgan Johnson. Uh, she is a uh, graduate of Meredith College, a class of 2020, a very newly minted graduate. Um, she established a stellar reputation while she was an undergraduate here at Meredith. She majored in history, she minored in Spanish. 
Um, and Morgan is also the 2020 recipient of the Sarah Lemon Award, which is the highest honor that the Meredith College Department of History bestows upon a major in one of our programs. This honor reflected not only her academic excellence and outstanding research, but also her leadership across campus. Morgan produced a podcast showcasing her research on Meredith College suffragists, and she has published part of her ERA research project, her thesis research, and her suffrage research in the Tar Heel Junior Historian, a publication of the North Carolina Museum of History. Morgan will be starting graduate school in January at UNC Greensboro, where she will pursue a master's in the library, <clears throat> excuse me, in the library and information studies program. Please join me in welcoming Morgan Johnson. Thanks, that was a really nice introduction. Um, I just wanna warn everybody while I'm pulling up my presentation, uh, my power was just flickering, so if I, go out, that's what happened. Um, so hopefully it doesn't, I think we're good now. Um, so like Dr. Robbins mentioned, I got a lot of experience in different kinds of research at Meredith. And one thing I got a lot of experience in, in particular was oral history. So I wanna talk a little bit about my exact experience in oral history. I wanna talk about oral history in general, and then to kind of bring it back around to what we're here for today, why I think oral history is a really great tool for collecting the stories of women in particular. So if my PowerPoint works, here we go. Um, while I was at Meredith, I did probably about 30 oral history interviews. A handful of those were done as part of my general coursework. Um, if you don't know, you'll know by the end of today that Meredith has a growing collection of oral histories by North Carolinian women. So in my general classes, I did a few interviews with family members, family friends, but the bulk of my experience came with the Women's Forum series of interviews that I did. So that was an undergraduate research project I did um, through the undergraduate research department in the summer of 2017, mostly, uh, alongside a research partner, Miranda Pickart. She is a class of 2018 and she's a social studies teacher in high school in Wake County. Um, so that's why she couldn't be here today, but I wanna give Miranda a shout out. And um, it really was like a 50-50 job on this women's forum series. So I just wanna emphasize that. Um, so this series of interviews was with current and past members of the North Carolina Women's Forum about the fight for the ERA in North Carolina. So there's a few moving parts there that I wanna break down. So the Women's Forum is a nonpartisan organization comprised of women leaders in North Carolina and their goal is to achieve gender equality in our state. Um, and it's an invitation only organization. So it's pretty prestigious. So we were really lucky and got to meet um, some really incredible women. And the organization, um, Women's Forum as an organization and the women we were interviewing as individuals were very involved in the fight for the Equal Rights Amendment or the ERA in North Carolina. So what's the ERA? Um, the ERA is and was a proposed amendment to the US Constitution that basically just said, um, you can't discriminate based on sex. That's what it said. And it was approved by Congress in 1972 and uh, it was given a ratification period of 10 years. So three fourths of the states had to approve of the amendment by 1982. And um, if you know this story, you know it did not end the way people wanted it to. And uh, the ERA was two states short of being added to the constitution. And North Carolina was one of those states that did not ratify the ERA but it was a very narrow vote and the fight for the ERA was really intense in North Carolina. So we uh, got a really uh, great look into the fight for the ERA in the state through these interviews. I've included uh, two maps that we made a few years ago of where we did these interviews. So about half of them we did on campus at Meredith and about half of them we were welcomed into our interviewees homes. The, you can see the farthest we went was Asheville. Uh, we made a weekend trip out of it. it was, we had a good time. Um, 
I'm not going to talk too much about what exactly we learned about the ERA. I have a few anecdotes I'm going to share, but if you have any questions about the ERA, put them in the Q&A and we can get to that. But I want to talk more about oral history in general. So obviously oral history is pretty different from traditional research. So um, usually for history research, you're in a library looking at secondary sources, looking over archival materials. But if you're doing oral history, you're maybe sitting in someone's living room talking to them. So that's obviously pretty different than what I was used to uh, doing research as a history major. Um, and I think something else that's unique about oral history is that you get to use a lot more technology than you might get to in traditional research. So we uh, video recorded almost all of our interviews, audio recorded all of them. There's uh, paperwork that goes along with it that has to be backed up. All of these files have to be backed up. And then uh, later on in the process, you transcribe the interviews, which also takes a good amount of time. And we had help with that from uh, Dominique Bateman, who's a class of 2019 alum. Uh, just to shout her out too. So um, I consider myself pretty computer savvy. So I really enjoyed that aspect of this project, but um, that was something else that was a little bit different from traditional research. Um, and I think something else that makes oral history unique and what um, makes it really a really great tool is that it can, it brings individuals of a movement of a period that you're trying to study to life in a way that I don't think traditional research can quite achieve. Um, you know, Dr. Robbins mentioned I've done research on suffrage and unfortunately I can't interview a suffragist and because um, women's records haven't been kept in the same way as men's, um, we don't have this level of detail about suffragists that now we have about the ERA in North Carolina because of this project that we did. So um, that's something that deep level of detail is really invaluable. Um, most of our interviews were 90 minutes, two hours or more. So that is uh, telling to the amount of detail that we would get from these interviewees, um, many different antidotes. So um, just really invaluable information. Um, oral history has some drawbacks too that are unique to it as a research method. One of them, like I kind of mentioned, was that you're limited to more modern topics. Obviously, I can't interview a World War I veteran, um, but the ERA is in a good sweet spot right now because it is 40, 50 years ago. So um, another drawback, speaking of 40, 50 years ago, is that um, Oral tradition, someone reminiscing on something that happened decades ago is one of the least reliable sources of information we have as historians. It's not unreliable, it's not unreliable, but it's just, um, it's not as reliable. So um, you do have elements of traditional research that can come into doing oral history project because you're um, cross-checking some information that interviewees might be giving you. Uh, we didn't, come across any major discrepancies in our research, but we did have a story that could have turned into that. This is really just an excuse for me to bring in this story because I think it's so great. Um, so you can see on the left here, there's this political cartoon and this is from the Raleigh News and Observer from June, 1982. And it's depicting a story that a lot of our interviewees were telling us. And uh, we were really excited when we found this political cartoon because it like, proved that this actually happened. So long story short, um, it was right before the General Assembly in North Carolina was going to vote on the ERA. And a lot of our interviewees were lobbyists who had worked really hard with uh, politicians in North Carolina to get them to vote yes on this amendment. And a group of these politicians who had said they were going to vote yes had a secret meeting right before the vote to agree to vote no and just mess everything up and not get the ERA passed. And it worked by the way. Um, but so they're having a secret meeting and one of the politicians finds out that a lobbyist he uh, was familiar with, she was pretty notorious uh, and her name was Betty McCain and you can see her in the background with her ERA sign and we interviewed her. Um, he found out she was waiting for him outside because the lobbyists found out they were having the secret meeting and he was scared of her. So he hid 
uh, underneath or behind a pew in uh, the chapel. They were meeting in the chapel's legislative building. And uh, this became a pretty humorous story that was spread not only in the News and Observer, but um, it still lives on today through our interviewees because they love telling the story. So, um, but that's an example of something. If only one person had told us that story and we couldn't find anything in the News and Observer, that's something you want to research more into to make sure that um, things were being remembered correctly. So to bring it back to what we're really here for today talking about women. I think oral history is a really great tool for um, for collecting the stories of women. We know that in the history field, women have been woefully overlooked. Um, it's getting better. I will like I will say that um, it's getting a lot better, and I don't want to um, ignore that. Um, but especially women of color have been left out. We were lucky enough to interview a few women of color in our series. Um, the ERA was, I would consider, largely a white women's movement, and there's a whole socioeconomic reason for that that I won't get into. But um, like I was saying earlier, it's pretty rare to have these detailed accounts of individuals, and I think this is especially the case for women, um, at least in my experience doing a lot of different research projects on women. Um, it's, it's pretty special to have, um, this level of intimacy with, um, a topic that you're researching and getting to hear a woman who was involved in the movement also talk about her divorce or her struggles, um, getting a job in the seventies, eighties, because there wasn't an ERA, um, and I think something that made this project in particular really special um, and it's something I didn't quite realize until later on as I brought this experience into the projects I did later during my time at Meredith is that um, the ERA is often overlooked. I didn't even know what it was <laughs> until maybe two months before I started this project um, because it failed, the movement failed. And I think a lot of times we overlook movements um, or marginalized groups that haven't yet made the strides that they're trying to make because oh well that movement failed so um but i was i were i talked to these women who had spent decades are continuing to spend their time and energy even though they're in their 80s um fighting for this amendment and i think that that work needs to be recognized and so i was really glad that i was able to um, contribute to preserving this period of time in north carolina um, and I think on that note, there's a lot of opportunity to uh, develop projects and series for marginalized groups. Um, and I just wanna encourage it like any students that are here today, um, you're really lucky at Meredith that you have a lot of research opportunities that you can grab onto. So if you're interested in a topic and think oral history would be a good way to capture it, I would definitely encourage you to pursue that. Um, I think it, uh, helps you develop a lot of different types of skills, not just your skills as a researcher, as a historian, as a scholar, but also, like I mentioned, uh, technology skills, learning different ways of doing research, interpersonal skills. Um, it's a really unique form of research, and I'm really glad that I got the opportunity to experience it while I was at Meredith. Um, so yeah, that's all I have. And I think now I'm handing it off to a video presentation from the archives. Hello, my name is Carrie Nichols and I'm the head of technical services for the Carlisle Campbell Library. Janice Snyker, our archives associate, and I have the pleasure of working in the college archives. Thank you, Dr. Robbins, for the invitation to participate in today's program. Oral histories are important primary sources that capture and preserve the personal experiences and views of individuals as they relate to events, eras, timelines, careers, memories of Meredith College, and on and on. And the College Archives has been collecting oral histories for quite some time now.
In addition to the oral, Women's Oral History Collection and the Women's Forum Collection, we have other oral histories from alumni, faculty, staff, and students. Our earliest oral histories were conducted by a Meredith alum named Jean Batten Cooper in 1988 for her Master of Arts degree in Liberal Studies at Wake Forest University, she conducted a series of oral history interviews with Meredith College alumni. The collection included 24 oral histories. Some of the alumni that she interviewed were Roxy Simpson Laybourne, class of 1932, the world's first forensic ornithologist, well known for her work with the Smithsonian, Hazel Beatty, class of 1926 and the librarian of Meredith College from 1941 to 1972. A beloved English professor, Norma Rose from the class of 1936. Mary Steele Smith from the class of 1913 and the first Meredith graduate to receive a PhD. As well as Ona Long Rutzler from the class of 1907. At the time of, of Miss Batten's interviews, she was the oldest living alumna. Batten's work entitled A Portrait of a Meredith Woman is a fascinating collection of women's stories as it reflects such a wide range of professional and service experiences of Meredith graduates and is a valuable source of information on the history of Meredith College. Now, let's fast forward to 2020, and yes, some great things did happen in 2020. Our latest oral history interview was conducted this past summer. Dr. Daniel Fountain, professor of history at Meredith, and Anaya Rivera, a history and public history major, had the pleasure of interviewing North Carolina's former governor, Beverly Perdue. A little backstory. Back in January of this year, the library received a donation of personal, biographical, and campaign materials from Ms. Beverly Perdue. The collection spans about 12.5 linear feet and includes documents from her career as an educator, her service in the Senate, her service as Lieutenant Governor, and as the first woman to serve as Governor of North Carolina. The collection includes her notebooks, daily calendars, travel notebooks, photos, debate videos, debate prep videos, campaign advertisements, plaques, awards, as well as inaugural materials. Here are a couple of photo highlights from the collection. This is a photo of her various inaugural materials, the pen used to sign the executive change order, her inaugural speech, and her inaugural transition notebook. Additionally, there are hundreds of photos documenting the inauguration. The next slide we have is just a collection of some of the materials. A photo of Ms. Perdue and her husband with Dolly Parton. The pen used to sign the North Carolina Lottery at Breaking the Tie. Um, various calendars dating back to the 1980s and a photo with former President Obama and his wife Michelle. And yes, these are signed. It is an amazing collection and we're so excited and honored to have it at Meredith College. This collection will be heavily used by our students as they study the best practices in historical and political research. And although the collection is still being processed, one student, Anaya Rivera, was given complete access to the collection this past summer for her summer research project. Anaya spent the summer researching the former governor's years of service and her commitment to education. Anaya's research resulted in an exhibit entitled Beverly Purdue, Educator in Chief. Here are a couple of photos of Anaya working with the materials. Next, we have a photo of Anaya and President Allen at the exhibit, which was on display in Ledford Hall from late August to September 17, 2020. This exhibit is now on display in the foyer of the Carlisle Campbell Library. Finally, a photo of an unmasked Anaya by her exhibit. I'm pleased to have Anaya Rivera with me today to talk about her work with the Purdue Collection. 
Hi, Anaya. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you so much for agreeing to chat with me today. I know it's a busy time in the semester, so thank you. Of course. As I mentioned earlier, you were the first student to dive into the collection contents. So if you would, tell us a little bit about your summer research project, you know, talk about your work with the materials and the outside research that you did. Well, I started off with the outside research, um, which was actually very convenient with everything going on with COVID and having to be sent home. Um, it was just very convenient to be able to start with that outside research, which was mostly biographical. So just finding out little things about her life, um, where she's from, her life as a child, her life as a mom, as a wife, um, as a politician, as a teacher, as a healthcare provider. So just like little things like that was what really took up most of the outside research. And then during the end of the summer, closer to the beginning of the academic year, I was able to come into the library and start working with the materials. And through that, I really started to look at different things that would piece together the story that I wanted to tell in the exhibit, um, which was difficult because <laughs> there's a lot of materials in the things that she's donated to the college. Um, but it was also really fun just to go through and kind of get a sneak peek at her life, going through like her daily planners and her calendars um, and just seeing like what she did on the day to day basis. It was really, really interesting, really insightful. It really showed when you look at those calendars, you know, just how disciplined you have to be in order to get all those things accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, once you started working with the materials um, in the library, um, what did you find, or even during your own research, what did you find most interesting or unexpected? Um, I think the most interesting thing that I found was how like relatable she was. She's definitely a woman of the people. Uh, I don't know, just coming into it, I didn't have this very clear understanding that as a politician they're still a person kind of like how we look at celebrities we don't view them as a person they're just like like of something else they're made of some other quality that we don't have um but to go through her the things that she's donated and to go through outside research i really saw how how much she was a woman of the people she was a mom she had to go through being a single mom she's been through a divorce like she's a politician she's been a teacher she's been through the education system so she sees firsthand where things need to be needs to be fixed and even th doing that she sent her children through the education system so again seeing firsthand what needed to be fixed and I think I, that's not something I was expecting I don't really know what I was expecting but that definitely wasn't it and just to see like she knows what we're going through are, and what parents are going through, what students are going through, what women are going through. She's experienced all of that firsthand. That was just very surprising for me, for lack of better words. It, it truly shows um, that she looked or has taken on these positions truly in service to others. Yeah. Um, Juggling all of those things, you know, juggling mm -hmm. being a single mom, being a politician, and still managing to get everything done and doing it well. Yeah. Um, that that was very eye-opening. Um, and it's something that I think that um, this collection will show, you know, to students, um, sort of as, as a guide for you mm -hmm. want to go into to leadership positions. Um, her life. Yeah. Uh, as sort of represented in this collection mm -hmm. um, is sort of uh, a guide to, to getting there. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's an inspirational collection. And even not even like for students not wanting to necessarily go into that leadership role, we're in a time where we have to juggle a lot. Yes. We're juggling school, mm -hmm. juggling that through COVID, the shortened semester, which means a lot of work in a short amount of time, 
this stressful election we're juggling a lot and then trying to stay healthy and take care of ourselves mm -hmm. we're juggling a lot and she shows that it, it's possible it's hard but in the end it's worth it yes yes so i remember listening uh to one of the comments that she made during the oral oral history and she said yes you can do it all but you have to do it with purpose mm -hmm. so yeah great now I've mentioned quite a bit about the um, oral history um, interview that we did um, with Ms. Purdue, um, where she talked about, of course, her experiences. What were some of the other highlights or takeaways um, that stood out most in your mind? My main takeaway from that interview was her passion. Um, she, when she talked about each career that she's been in teaching, um, serving, as lieutenant governor and governor, being a, a healthcare professional, you could hear the passion in her voice. And it was just, that's something I'm gonna take away and keep with me for the rest of my life, I believe, because she's jumped from each of those careers at different parts of her life. And she let her passions lead her. No matter how many times her passions changed, she let her passions lead her. And I think that's something that everybody can learn from like no matter where your passion starts whether you started out wanting to be an astronaut you got to Meredith and now you want to be a historian follow that passion let that guide you because life is like life is too short to be doing something you don't want to do and we see that in her, in her life and in the items that she's collected and that was very evident in the oral um, oral history interview with her she did what she loved because she loved it and for no other reason. Exactly. Exactly. Um, for me, I think it was definitely the uh, passion as well that she, that she um, has shown um, that she's let lead her, as mm -hmm. you say. Um, the new perspectives that I gained about her work in education um, it is indeed a um, commitment, um, and it has even continued since her term as governor. Yeah. Um, her uh, work with DigiLearn. Digi Digi um, and I've just uh, recently read an article on her, um, I think it was maybe in, in WRAL, and they were talking, she was talking about her um, during this time, you know, the, 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 stu the um, teachers and um, how they uh, need the support, mm -hmm. you know, especially this time of, of, of COVID, um, how she is advo still advocating for their salaries, yes, uh, the technology support that they need, um, as well as, you know, additional resources to make sure that our public schools become the best that they can be and yeah. she is still advocating for that and that that's inspirational yes it really um, is. that that passion continues yeah mm -hmm. let's see um, for your final project you created an exhibit and while dr. Fountain <laughs> and I uh, sort of served as advisors um, we often took that back seat to allow you to fully execute and um, sort of develop your vision for the exhibit. Um, we've often said you were the curator. <laughs> <laughs> what did you find most challenging in creating the exhibit for your summer research project? Wow, um, the most challenging. I feel like it was very challenging altogether. But the most challenging part had to be going through the materials and figuring out what best told the story that I wanted to tell, which was focusing on what she's done for education. Mm -hmm. um, there were so many things that I could have used. And if you look at the pictures from the Ledford exhibit, and if you come into the library and see the exhibit that's up now, that's so little for the amount of materials that I had access to. And that was so hard to like, just narrow everything down to like, this is what most clearly tells the story. This is how I can be concise and get my message across, which is 
a big thing for historians to be able to do. Um, especially as curators, you have this limited amount of space that you can use and you have to be able to get that story across and get that message across clearly to audience of every ages from 8 to 82. Mm -hmm. Like everybody has to be able to understand what you're trying to say. Um, and that was really hard. And going along with that, captioning the materials, that was a struggle. Um, I don't consider myself a good writer as it is when I have five pages to my to my use to like write something and all I have was like this little note card size of paper and um that that proved to be difficult but it definitely was a learning experience that I will take with me into my desired career hopefully um so yeah I think besides having to do this this project carrying on into the beginning of the semester and having to juggle classwork with finishing up the exhibit, I think just finding those materials and then captioning those materials were definitely the hardest parts. Well, I think you did a wonderful job and we've received lots of wonderful comments about <laughs> um, the exhibit, how much people enjoy mm -hmm. actually seeing um, that exhibit of her life um, because you've captured not only um, her work in education, but her as a person, which I think is fantastic. And, and that's something that you sort of struggle to do, you yeah. know, how to, how to balance it. Yeah. Um, you did it well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, Anaya, you're going to be completing an internship in the college archives during the spring semester. Yeah. And while I have several projects that um, <laughs> I'm excited to work with you on, um, I know that you're looking forward to continuing your work with the Purdue Collection. Um, what are you most excited about in working on uh, continuing your work with that collection? I'm excited about making a bigger dent in the, <laughs> in the materials that's been donated because I have in no way looked through everything. Um, and also for the possibility of there being another exhibit yes. with those materials. Um, as challenging as it was to sit back and look at it and understand that that's something that I did. Like, I, I did that. That's so, like, huh, that's that warms my heart. Like, because this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. This is my career choice. And to see that I have the ability to do it still in, in undergrad, that is so amazing so in my opinion so i'm excited for the possibility of there being another exhibit and getting again to work with her because she is such a down-to-earth person yes do you have an idea of what exhibit you might want to do next of her materials i have no idea um for the most part other than education i've only gone through like biographical things mm -hmm. so as of right now i feel like my knowledge of her t in order to create another exhibit would be like a biographical exhibit up to this point in her life now, which I think is equally as interesting as what she's done for education. One thing that I hope that we are able to, you know, during our internship that we're able to, um, to include is one thing with um, collections that you have you constantly keep them up to date mm -hmm. so one part of uh, of the uh, internship will be what is she doing now and making sure that we are bringing that collection um, up to 2020 so yeah um, you know I'm going to definitely look forward to having you as an intern um, uh, in the spring I look forward to it as well <laughs> This collection is one that I hope will be one of our uh, Women in Leadership mm -hmm. um, series. I mean, I would like to have other uh, women in leadership actually donate their material so that we can add to the collection um, that we have. Yeah. Um, I think it would be wonderful research opportunities for our students. Yes, okay. definitely. <laughs> Well, thank you, Anaya, for sharing your experiences and insights with uh, us today. Of course. Um, and I look forward, as I said, to working with you uh, in the spring as we continue our work with the collection. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Finally, to all alumni, faculty, staff, and students, as we continue to collect oral histories, we would love to have your story in the archives collection. If you're interested in participating in an oral history interview, please email archives at meredith.edu. Thank you. Wow, thank you to all of our presenters. I've learned so much today. I'm sure our attendees have as well. Um, I can't help but reflect on how when women are the focus and when women are the ones doing the research um, and working in the archives, that the um, process even changes, right? The way we do the history changes because women are the ones that are the focus and we take more innovative approaches um, as we're collecting this history. Just absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm gonna invite all of our panelists to rejoin us uh, as I um, share the uh, attendees questions with you. And of course, welcome you to uh, make comments and ask questions of each other. Um, I'm gonna start with my colleague, Dan Fountain's question. This is something that um, came to the surface over and over and over again during the oral history project that Morgan was talking about in particular, but it applies to other uh, oral history projects as well. Um, one of the challenges he reminds us of archiving women's history is getting women to acknowledge their own contributions to history. Um, what recommendations do you have for public outreach to encourage women to consider donating to collections that help historians document women's contributions. Morgan, since you worked on this particular project and we know that was an issue there, would you like to kick this one off? Yeah, well, I do wanna emphasize like that is an issue. I know when, um, I did interviews specifically with like family members and family friends. I know my grandma was hesitant to do it when I asked her because she just didn't think like, oh, I don't have anything important to say. But um, I kind of explained to her like the stories of everyday women are important. Um, my grandparents were, they had three kids. They were pretty poor. And um, my grandma worked full-time jobs um, when it, probably wasn't very common for women to do that. So I was explaining to her like that's significant. Um, so it is a problem. I think with the Women's Forum series, since those women had been identified through their membership to the Women's Forum, um, that they were leaders, I think for that group of women, it was less of a problem because, um, and they were just really, um, they're really enthusiastic to share their experiences about the ERA anyway, because like I said, I think the ERA is always overlooked. So they're like, finally, I get to talk about this. Like, this is my favorite thing to talk about. So um, I guess in terms of like public outreach, I think some of it probably comes from the way we present uh, women's history in general. So I think there's some work to be done in uh, recognizing normal women more in exhibits and in documentaries and in research. Um, so I think it might start there. I don't know if anyone else has anything better to add. For me, I believe that it really honors women to have their stories, um, to, to, um, to actually have the oral histories. Um, it's a way to look at filling in sort of those gaps that you don't get from the history books and those kinds of things, telling those personal stories. It's important, um, especially um, as it relates to research. Um, yeah, it's just, for me, like I said, it's just important to honor um, the women uh, as they tell those stories. Um, in terms of outreach, we just have to keep reiterating the importance of telling women's stories um, and the value that they um, their stories bring to any type of research uh, because women, um, their experiences, they matter. So. And 
just to touch on a few things which I think are going to echo uh, what Morgan and Carrie have already said. Um, but for me, I think I think we would all agree, right? Like storytelling is really valuable and a way to connect with people. And so, um, what one of my favorite things about how how archiving South Carolina women has kind of expanded into a network is that. Dr. Waters has these papers, but she still has connections with other women that are still in Columbia. And so when uh, she and Travis started working on archiving South Carolina women, she starts talking to her friends and some, some people who are now deceased. Um, but through that, there are now like four or five, maybe six at this point, other women who um, have used Dr. Waters as kind of the conduit to also donate their paper. And it's the same story of, of Dr. Waters having these uh, boxes in a storage unit which a leak was developing over them and it's it's the same thing they're like oh I had these boxes in my basement I had these boxes in my attic and I knew it was important but I didn't think anyone else would think it was important um, and so in this way I think that if you have this is why I argue I think that um, my my project is quite new for like a history project it's like the 90s and, and like 2007 um, but I think that if you can if you can really make connections with the people that were doing the work, like with the ERA, right? That you can create, you can really tap into these, these networks of women, not in a way that's extractive, but in a way that's like, hey, we know what you did was important um, and we need to document it, it's valuable. And then I think also, if you want, to, if you need to emphasize to someone, like maybe you don't think you as a person um, are valuable, which like you are. You know what I mean? But if you need to argue that like, well, maybe if you think your your work wasn't that important, but if you think womanhood in general is important, like you are a member of that. And yeah, everyday women's stories reveal that identity. So even if you think, you know, I was just a mom or I was just working or something, it's like, but you're a woman. And so we need that story kind of broadly. Yeah, that's a wonderful reminder. And, and I'm struck by, this idea of women creating these networks, which of course, you know, we have networks already, they're already existing, obviously, but to actually talk to each other about the value and the meaning of these things so that you don't have somebody's grandma dying and leaving this wonderful collection in the attic that nobody paid attention to or seemed to care about when she was living. You know, if we can just have these conversations with each other um, and make it clear that, you know, at places like University of South Carolina, at places like Meredith College, you know, scholars are actively seeking to collect these materials and tell these stories. So however we can get that message out to people, you know, through our various networks is so valuable. Um, Kira, I'm going to throw this one to you um, first, too, um, because your, as you say, your research is about such recent history. Um, one of our attendees asked, um, are women's oral histories discoverable now on Facebook? If so, how will archivists archive these assets? We have a cohort that's been documenting their lives on Facebook close to 20 years now. Well, my first response would be, I'm not sure um, about kind of other collections, but what I would it's interesting that you bring up Facebook because I, I just read an article for a different project about um, how there is, how Facebook is being used by groups of indigenous people to share their history because um, it can be kind of private. So you can, you can control who has access to it. And also Facebook allows people that are separated um, geographically to share things together. And I think that if, there, if there's interest in this group in sharing those materials, um, then I suppose the, it, here's the thing to me though, the question would be, do you want this in kind of an institutional repository? In that case, I would say maybe reach out. Um, I know that there's obviously oral history collections at Meredith. Um, if it was in South Carolina, I know that we have an oral history department, right? So if you want to do that, reach out. But I think that also like with things like archive.org, um, you can have total control over making it discoverable, if that's something that the, the, the group of people want. So I think it's really a question of, of starting there with the group of people that have oral histories and say like, where, where would you like these held? Like, who do you want this to be open to? Is presence in an institutional repository important to you? Or do we wanna kind of keep the work in house, I suppose? 
Carrie, what do you think as, as an archivist responsible for collecting these histories? I agree with um, Kira in terms of uh, do they want those collections and where do they want those collections to eventually reside or, or um, open it to a broader um, spectrum? Um, archive.org is a possibility, but it's, it's, it really depends on where, of course, we would love them. <laughs> Um, I'm sure University of South Carolina would love them, but it's that group in terms of where they would like to, to um, have uh, those items um, reside, you know, what depository uh, would they like to contribute them to. Um, we are always, of course, um, wanting to get um, oral histories, of course, for uh, of our alums. Um, um, actually talking with them, you know, finding out more about the history of Meredith College. Um, and hopefully after today's presentation, <laughs> we may get some other um, con um, contacts and, and be able to, to do some more of that. Um, one of my goals here is to make sure that we have a diverse collection, uh, that we um, not only have uh, oral histories from our faculty, our staff, our students and our alums, but a diverse representation. So. Yeah, that would be wonderful if we were to suddenly get a bunch of phone calls or emails saying, oh, you know, I want to do an interview or I want my mom to do an interview. That would be pretty great. <laughs> yes, yes. So another question uh, from one of our attendees. Uh, this is from Liza. And um, let's start with Anaya, since you just had your summer research project with this one and then everyone else can weigh in. Um, in general, what kinds of questions do you ask when conducting interviews for oral histories? Do you find out their whole life story usually or focus on snippets? And she also said, this is also interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, in general, for oral history projects that I have taken part in, I usually start off with a very very broad open-ended question about like their background um, and through that you do end up finding out a lot about their life story even if that's not intentional but uh, asking those open-ended questions just makes them more comfortable and open to be vulnerable with you and through that you are able to pick up things like that are specific to what you want to wanted to interview them about. So for example, in, um, in holding an interview with um, former governor Beverly Perdue, asking her about her childhood, um, her parents really encouraged um, valuing education. And then through that, you can go to asking questions about, well, how did this shape you and and working for education? How did this shape you in deciding whether or not you were gonna to go to college? Like you can take bits of their life story and kind of zone it into what you're looking for. And so I think that's the most important part about conducting an interview. It's, it's um, allowing them to feel comfortable with you, to be vulnerable, and then just going with the flow. Cause you don't wanna make it full of pressure for them because that just causes people to shut down, whether that's in an interview or just having a conversation in a classroom setting, like you forcing something on somebody more often than not forces them to shut down. So being able to establish that open conversation and let them know that you're listening and that you care. If they're going off on a tangent, don't just zone out, you know, like, you know, lean into it because you'll find information that you didn't even know you were looking for. I definitely agree with everything Anaya just said. Um, for the ERA project, we, in terms of like what a questionnaire looks like, um, we had, we included general questions about the interviewee's life. And we had a list of questions that was specifically about the ERA. And so um, a lot of times that all in intermingled. So with, for those interviews, we got a good picture of a woman's life in general and about the ERA specifically. Like I mentioned, these interviews were like hour and a half, two hours long. Some of them were like three hours long. So 
um, you can get a lot of information in that amount of time. Um, and then other interviews I've done, just general questions. Um, you know, how, what was your education like? What was your family life like? Um, and like Anaya said, oftentimes you ask an open-ended question because those are the best kind of questions to ask. Um, that'll invite the interviewee to remember, oh, this, oh, this. And um, like Anaya said, just, just let them go. That's my philosophy, just let them go. And um, they'll share all kinds of wonderful information with you. All right, so we have one more question, uh, which, which is about the Meredith archives in particular. Um, but I think it's a good idea for us to, again, broaden this out to think in terms of other collections um, when we're doing our research. Uh, but this particular question is, what kinds of other materials does the Meredith Archives have and how can students engage with them for research? So again, we might broaden that out and say, um, for students in particular who are thinking about doing research, what kinds of materials can you find in an archives? Because sometimes people aren't really familiar with that. So what kinds of things have you guys engaged with in archives? Well, I'll, I'll start this off um, in terms of the Meredith College Archives. We have various categories of materials. Um, we have, of course, presidential uh, correspondence. We have uh, faculty minutes of all of the uh, faculty meetings that have happened throughout the years. We have materials. Uh, from the board of trustees that go back to the beginning of the college. We have photographs uh, going back to uh, as early as photographs <laughs> were available. We have uh, departmental information uh, and the list goes on and on. Whenever you think about um, different departments, uh, different organizations, uh, student organizations, faculty organizations, uh, faculty groups. Um, we have a representation uh, or documents and information about each one of those. Um, there are, in terms of getting access to that, we are trying to digitize more so that you can actually have access to many of those materials online. We have a uh, website, uh, an archives website, which is part of the library's overall website where we have tried to make as many of our publications available uh, and continue, continuing to digitize and make more of that available. Um, I'm currently now working on a strategic plan that um, will helpfully, hopefully guide uh, us to securing some funding, requesting some grants and those sorts of things to make more of uh, archival materials available because we have many, many formats, uh, many types of materials. I think something that's also interesting to think about, again, this is from a recent article that I read, um, is how how people outside of kind of the, the traditional folks that use archives, like historians, how you can get those people involved um, in the materials in, of an archive. So at Meredith, you, uh, Carrie, you said that there are ornithology, an ornithologist, which I believe is birds, um, but I'm not a scientist, but I think like how interesting is it to, to have people maybe in the sciences um, have access to those records and see what could happen, right? Health sciences people. Um, in archiving South Carolina women, as I noted, there are, there are materials from Columbia, the country, and totally like serendipitously, totally by chance, my roommate, um, she graduated, but she used to be my roommate in the public history department, was working with a professor in the Spanish department um, on a truth commission for Columbia, uh, people of the Colombian diaspora. So totally by chance, Right, it's like, oh, you're working with these people. There are materials in this archive if you if you'd like to look at them. And so then I think the question really becomes, um, how how do we do that work of saying, hey, 
ornithologists come look what we have like oh Spanish department look what we have I think the question is how do we do that without um, relying exclusively on kind of those interpersonal connections and how do we make the information more widely known rather than just relying on people who know archivists to, to tell them. That's a really good point. Um, talking about how um, maybe we can expand the types of people that use archives. Um, I interned at the state archives and one of the one of the main things I did was working with our Flickr account. Um, so the state archives has a Flickr account that has like over a hundred thousand images, and we're working on uh, tagging those and adding descriptions. Most of them are they're really well organized. So. Um, one of the collections I worked with were uh, aerial view photos from the 1930s, I think, from the USDA. So I feel like those kinds of aerial photos isn't something I would probably ever use, but there are definitely people out there that would use that, um, looking at like agricultural history or um, like geography. So um, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity out there to expand who is using archival materials. Yeah, and there are a lot of surprises in archives, <laughs> you know, so it's worth it to really just sort of check around. And I know when I was, a, um, you know, conducting research as a graduate student, it's always good to have conversations with people, who, with staff who work at the archives and say to them, this is what I'm working on. And they can help you find the most appropriate materials. They can help you zero in on things. And that's always a good thing to do as well. So. Yeah, it's not, you know, if you're if you're running at running into dead ends because you're looking in books or maybe looking at some primary sources, the archives are so full of so many wonderful treasures. Um, you just have to sometimes ask people questions about what you know what they have to offer. Um, we have one more question, uh, and this is specifically for Kira from Jean Jackson, um, one of our um, deans here at the college. Uh, for Kira, how do you go about archiving an entity like REN, Women's Rights and Empowerment Network, a relatively new advocacy group in South Carolina? Um, I would say my first response is probably like the most boring because it's not related to like physical archiving at all. Um, but it's, it's creating relationships with people in the organization. Um, because I think in, in trying to foster, there's always power imbalances with, with archives and with archival projects, um, especially if they're connected to an institution. And so it's like, yes, it is kind of validating to say like, oh, an archive wants my materials, but that might not always be what the group wants. And so I think just trying to create those connections with a group like, hello, we're really interested in the work that you do we would be interested in kind of informing a relationship with the people rather than with the information to try not to be extractive. I think also something that is, is good for archivists and information professionals to practice in general is to try to communicate how we do the work that we do. Like how do we organize our materials? And if the group doesn't, doesn't end up wanting to um, share their materials, that's fine. But for the good of that organization saying, hey, you're probably gonna be developing a lot, of, a lot of materials. Here's how you could maybe go about um, setting up databases or even like setting up folder hierarchies on a desktop, right? And I think sharing that information and why that's valuable, not just for archivists, um, but for the organization to be successful um, moving forward. Because at, at a certain point, hopefully the, the organization will get to a point where there's all new people and so you want to make sure that that information is not relying on uh, on a person, but instead it, it's navigable for anyone that enters. Um, so yeah, I would say relationship building and just sharing like what archivists do very broadly in terms of organizing information is really helpful. And I think being willing to share that and be a partner also demonstrates that you're willing to be a true partner and to exchange and have a reciprocal relationship rather than just saying like, hey, <laughs> we want your stuff, please and thank you. Like you can drop it off at the door, right? Yeah, that's such a valuable point. And, you know, and, and you did a great job of 
talking about that in your presentation as well, that the idea is that we're creating partnerships. Uh, institutions can be really scary and really intimidating for people and you don't know where to start, you don't know who to start with. Um, and it can really feel like it's, it's not the appropriate place or venue. And again, one of the things I really appreciate about your, your work and your presentation is that you're, you're, you're actively um, working toward with this collection bringing the community in as partners in this whole endeavor. And I love that empowerment is part of the mission statement. <laughs> it's just a yeah, wonderful, sure. wonderful thing. Yeah, and I think it's, I think it's important um, in that you want, I, I feel in my professional praxis, and I hope others agree, that you want the history and the community to shape the archiving. Because if the archiving is is kind of exclusive, a, a process that is just um, happens the same way no matter what the collection is, I think that that might also drive people away because it's like, well, we don't want to lose the interpretation that we know is important to this collection when it goes into this this place of like informational neutrality, which isn't true anyway. Um, but I think yeah, it's important to have the history and the ethos of the community shape the practice and have that be a, a conversation. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, and one final note, um, also from Jean Jackson. Uh, she uh, wanted you to know, Kira, executive director of REN is Ann Warner. You would enjoy getting to know her, she said. She's a Wellesley and Columbia graduate. She's a fierce advocate for women. And she just happens to be Dr. Jackson's niece. <laughs> that's great. No, yeah, that's great. If you want to drop her contact information. Sure, yeah, sure. so yeah. Connections yeah, that would be great. Relationships. Yeah, and I think that it's it's good to um to set up archiving South Carolina women as like starting kind of uh, with Dr. Waters and with the Commission on Women, but really letting it breathe and grow. I think is great because yeah, we want it to to keep living and to be beyond like these iterations of students right and to have it have it not ever have it not ever end right like it'll be alive forever and growing and breathing because it's it's its own kind of thing yeah that that's great that's good to know for sure wonderful well that is um, i cannot think of a more appropriate way to sign off that was perfect kira thank you uh thank you to all of our panelists this has been really an engaging program we appreciate it so much Thank you to our attendees for being with us today. Uh, and if you want to review the program, we will have the recording up on the Meredith College YouTube, YouTube channel um, as soon as we possibly can. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.